Hello, you guys. Today we are working on chapters 11 and 12 of Rainy Nightingale by Kate DiCamillo. Chapter 11. At home, after the very strange baton twirling class, Ramy sat in her room with the door closed and worked on the Little Miss Central Florida Tire application. It was a two-page, mimeographed form, and it was obvious that Mr. Pitt, the owner of Central Florida Tire, had typed the form himself. He was not a very good typist. The application was full of errors, which for some reason made the whole enterprise, the contest, and the hope that Ramy would win it, and the further hope that winning it would bring her father home, seemed dubious. The first question was in all capital letters. It said, Do you want to become Little Miss Central Florida Tire 1975? There was no space for an answer to this question. Still, it was a question, and Ramey felt like it would be best to answer it since the application said, Make sure you answer all questions. Ramey squeezed in the word yes right after the question mark. She used all capital letters. She thought about adding an exclamation mark, but decided against it. And then she filled in her name, Ramey Clark, and her address, 1213 Borton Street, Lister, Florida, and then her age, 10. She wondered if Louisiana and Beverly were sitting in their rooms filling out their applications. Did you have to fill out an application for a contest if you intended to sabotage the contest? Ramey closed her eyes and saw Louisiana writing the words, the flying elephantes, in the air with her baton. How could Ramey compete against somebody with, from a show business background? Ramey, began, Ramey opened her eyes and looked out from out the window. Old Mrs. Borkowski was sitting in a lawn chair in the middle of the road. Her shoes were untied. Her face was lifted up to the sun. Ramey's mother said that Mrs. Borkowski was as crazy as a loon. Ramey didn't know if this was true or not, but it seemed to her that Mrs. Borkowski knew things, important things. Some of the things she knew she told, and some of the things she knew she refused to tell, saying nothing but pfft when Louise, or when Ramey asked for more information. Old Mrs. Borkowski probably knew who the flying elephantes were. Ramey looked back down at the application. It said, please list all of your good deeds. Use a separate sheet of paper if necessary. Good deeds? What good deeds? Ramey's stomach clenched. She got up from the desk and left her room and went out to the front door, out the front door, and walked into the middle of the street. She stood in front of Mrs. Borkowski's lawn chair. What? said Mrs. Borkowski without opening her eyes. I'm filling out an application, said Ramey. Yes, and so? I'm supposed to do good deeds, said Ramey. One time, said Mrs. Borkowski. She smacked her lips. Her eyes were still closed. One time, a something happened. Obviously, Mrs. Borkowski intended to tell a story. Ramey sat down in the middle of the road at Mrs. Borkowski's feet. The pavement was warm. She looked at Mrs. Borkowski's untied shoes. Mrs. Borkowski never tied her shoes. She was too old to reach her feet. One time, a something happened, said Mrs. Borkowski again. I was on a boat at sea, and I saw a baby get snatched from his mother's arms by a bird, a gigantic seabird. Is this a story about a good deed, asked Ramey. It was terrible how the mother screamed. But the mother got the baby back, right? From a gigantic seabird? Never, said Mrs. Borkowski. Those gigantic seabirds, they keep what they take. Also, they steal buttons and hairpins. Mrs. Borkowski lowered her head and opened her eyes and looked at Ramey. She blinked. Mrs. Borkowski had very sad, extremely watery eyes. The wings of the seabird were huge. They looked like they belonged to an angel. So was the seabird actually an angel? Was it doing a good deed in saving the baby? Pfft, said Mrs. Borkowski. She waved her hand through the air. Who knows? I'm only telling you what happened. What I saw. Make of it what you will. Tomorrow you come over and cut my toenails, and I will give you some of that divinity candy, okay? Okay, said Ramey. Did cutting Mrs. Borkowski's toenails count as a good deed? Probably not. Mrs. Borkowski always gave Ramey candy in exchange for the toenail cutting, and if you got paid for something, it couldn't be a good deed. Mrs. Borkowski closed her eyes. She tilted her head back again. After a while, she started to snore. Ramey got up and went to the house and into the kitchen. She picked up the phone and dialed her father's office. Clark Family Insurance, said Mrs. Sylvester in her cartoon bird voice. How may we protect you? Ramey said nothing. Mrs. Sylvester cleared her throat. Clark Family Insurance, she said again. How may we protect you? It was nice to hear Mrs. Sylvester ask, how may we protect you, a second time. Actually, Ramey thought that she would like to hear Mrs. Sylvester ask the question several hundred times a day. It was such a friendly question. 
It was a question that promised good things. Mrs. Sylvester, she said. Yes, dear, said Mrs. Sylvester. Ramy closed her eyes and imagined the gigantic jar of candy corn sitting on Mrs. Sylvester's desk. Sometimes in the late afternoon, the sun shone directly on the jar and lit it up so that it looked like a lamp. Ramy wondered if that was what was happening now. Behind Mrs. Sylvester's desk was the door to Ramy's father's office. That door would be closed and the office would be empty. No one would be sitting at her father's desk because her father was gone. Ramy tried to conjure up his face. She tried to imagine him sitting in his office at his desk. She couldn't do it. She felt a wave of panic. Her father had only been gone for two days, and she couldn't remember his face. She had to bring him back. She remembered why she was calling. Mrs. Sylvester, she said, you have to perform good deeds for the contest. Oh, honey, said Mrs. Sylvester, that is no problem at all. You just go down the street to the Golden Glen and offer to read to one of the residents. The elderly love to be read to. Did the elderly love to be read to? Ramy wasn't sure. Old Mrs. Orkowski was elderly, and what she always wanted Ramy to do was a clip to clip her toenails. How was your first baton twirling lesson? asked Mrs. Sylvester. It was interesting, said, it was interesting, said Ramy. An image of Louisiana Elefante falling to her knees flashed through her head. This image was followed by one of Beverly Topinski and her mother fighting over the baton in the cloud of gravel dust. Isn't it exciting to be learning something new? said Mrs. Sylvester. Yes, said Ramy. How's your mother doing, dear? said Mrs. Sylvester. She's sitting on the couch in the sunroom right now. She does that a lot. Mostly that's what she does. She doesn't really do anything else. She just sits there. Well, said Mrs. Sylvester, there was a long pause. It will be fine. You'll see. We all do what we can do. Okay, said Ramy. Louisiana's words floated through her head. I'm too terrified to go on. Ramy didn't say the words out loud, but she felt them pass through her. And Mrs. Sylvester, kind, bird-voiced Miss Mrs. Sylvester, must have felt them too because she said, You just select a suitable book for sharing, dear, and then go down to the Golden Glen. They will be very glad to see you there. You just do what you can do, okay? Everything will be fine. It will all work out right in the end. Chapter 12. So she has an idea of what she can do to have a good deed for the application. <clears throat> Chapter 12. It wasn't until Ramy hung up the phone that she wondered what Mrs. Sylvester meant by a suitable book. She walked into the living room and stood on the yellow shag carpet and stared at the bookcase. All the books were brown and serious. They were her father's books. What if he came back home and one was missing? She felt like maybe it would be best to leave them alone. Ramy went into her room. The shelves over her bed held rocks and seashells and stuffed animals and books. The borrowers? No. It was too unlikely. No normal adult would believe in tiny people who lived under the floorboards. Paddington Bear? Something about the book seemed too bright and silly for the seriousness of a nursing home. Little House in the Big Woods? A really old person had probably lived through all that history and wouldn't want to hear about it again. And then Ramy saw A Bright and Shining Path, The Life of Florence Nightingale. This was a book that Edward Option had given her on the last day of school. Mr. Option was the school librarian. He was very skinny and extremely tall. He had to duck his head to enter and exit the George Mason Willamette Elementary School Library. Mr. Option looked too young and uncertain to be a librarian. Also, his tie ties were too wide, and they were all painted with strange and lonely pictures of deserted beaches, haunted-looking forests, or UFOs. Sometimes when he held up a book, Mr. Option's hands shook with nervousness, or maybe it was ex excitement. In any case, on the last day of school, Edward Option had said to Ramy, You are such a good reader, Ramy, Ramy Clark, that I wonder if you might be interested in diversifying. I have here a non-fiction book that you might enjoy. Okay, said Ramy, even though she had absolutely no interest in non-fiction. She liked stories. Mr. Option held up a bright and shining path, The Life of Florence Nightingale. On the cover, there were dozens of soldiers stretched out on their backs in what looked like a battlefield, and the lady was walking in between the soldiers and carrying a lamp over her head, and the men were holding their hands out to her, begging her for something. There was no bright and shining path anywhere in sight. It looked like a horrible, depressing book. Maybe, said Mr. Option, maybe you could read this over the summer, and then we could talk about it together when school begins. Okay, said Ramy again, but she only agreed because she liked Mr. Option so much, and because he was so tall and lonely and hopeful. She had taken the Florence Nightingale book from him and brought it home and put it on her shelf. A few days later, her father had run away with Leanne Dickerson. 
and Raimi forgot all about Edward Option and his strange ties in his nonfiction book. But maybe someday somebody at the Golden Glen Nursing Home would want to hear about the life of Florence Nightingale and her shining path. Maybe it was exactly what Mrs. Sylvester meant by a suitable book. Maybe everything would work out right in the end. We'll be ready for Chapter 13 next time. See you then.